Dear friends, a good day. I am Yoshioka Keiko, editorial staff writer of Asahi. Welcome to Asahi World Forum entitled Taiwan Digital and Democracy. Thank you for joining. Without further ado, let me introduce the uh, speaker. Ms. Audrey Tan, who is the Executive Yuan Minister without portfolio in charge of digital affairs. So we are very pleased to have you. She's participating from Taipei remotely. Tan san, thank you very much for sharing your precious time for us today. Thank you. Thank you. Really, my honor to be virtually here. And I would like to uh, express my gratitude for us to having this time to talk about global issues and hopefully with global participation. First of all, very briefly, let me introduce to you Ms. Audrey Tan. At the age of uh, eight, uh, she learned programming on her own, and at age 15, she became one of the co-leaders co of IT company. At the age of 19, she went to Silicon Valley. She started business, and she became she carried on advising companies. At Apple, she was involved with a project of AI Siri. In 2016, she became the youngest minister in the Executive Yuan for Digital Affairs in the history of Taiwan. Tansan will join us for one hour and speaking on four themes. First point, uh, uh, Taiwan's response to COVID-19. Number two, digital democracy in Taiwan. Number three, relationship between AI and mankind. And the last point is the message to the Japanese youth and children. So this is the plan. Tansan, we'd like to begin the program. Thank you very much. Now we will go to the session. First question to Tan San. It is about the response uh, uh, to a uh, pandemic in Taiwan. Regarding uh, COVID-19, Taiwan is regarded as one of the best examples in countering COVID-19 in the world. Taiwan is regarded as one of the most advanced examples of uh, countering COVID-19 in many cases. What is the current situation regarding COVID-19? Uh, today, at the day of the recording, which is October 18, 2021, we have uh, the entire country have zero local cases, zero imported cases, and zero deaths today. So you are like an honor student. Do you have any challenges uh, as of now regarding uh, the pandemic? Our main challenge was the vaccination rate. When I was vaccinated in April, I had to convince, not very successfully, my friends and families and my colleague to get a jab. Because at that time, we've been like 10 months with no local cases. So people did not feel any urgency at all. So I was kind of weird in getting a self-funded jab at that time, AstraZeneca. Of course, by May, we encountered our real first wave, but because people uh, suddenly rushed uh, to want to get a vaccine, there wasn't sufficient supply because at a time in COVAX and other international arrangements, Taiwan was ranked very low in priority when it comes to vaccine urgency, which is why I almost will have no way to get my second jab because of the interest uh, in getting vaccinated, if not for the Japanese generous dedication donation of waves after waves of AstraZeneca shots to Taiwan. So let me uh, begin my talk by offering my sincere gratitude to the Japanese people and the Japanese government. Japanese vaccine was put to good use. That is a very happy news for us. Regarding Taiwan, you started with mask mapping and then the vaccination booking system, you, you said that it was very hard, but uh, contact tracing system, you introduced advanced systems utilizing digital technology in your country. So that was the counter COVID-19 systems you introduced. 
IT and the digital, as, as the minister in charge of digital affairs, uh, Mr. T uh, Ms. Tan, you made a great contribution. We want to learn from you. As of now, regarding the future countermeasures, uh, how are you going to plan a digital technology in COVID-19 programs? Do you have any ideas that you have in pipeline regarding a digital technology for the pandemic? Um, the system you are showing now, the 1922 SMS system, is an app-free design where anyone can just use the built-in camera of their phone even without unlocking the phone. Just point the built-in camera to the QR code, it automatically pops up the SMS to this well-trusted number, 1922, our Central Epidemic Command Center's number. And by pressing send, it takes maybe just two seconds to finish a check-in. And it's stored not in the government, but rather in the telecommunication carrier. So whichever carrier you use, that carrier will store this check-in for 28 days. And after 28 days, well, it's gone. So unless there's a real case where uh, the contact tracers need to piece together from five telecoms and also from the registration database of the QR code generation. It's only then these messages will be put together that shorten the contact tracing from 24 hours to less than 24 minutes. And out of the a quarter billion SMS sent this way since May, only around a million have been used. And of those million, anyone can use the website sms.1922 to look up which of their messages got looked at by which contact tracers in which municipality. So it's like reverse audit that preserves anonymity and privacy. Our upcoming work is to make sure that this design, far from a one-shot thing, can be written into the counter-pandemic acts to work on legalizing, institutionalizing these responses, much as how we institutionalize our SARS responses after the 2003 SARS incident. So institutionalization and making sure it's not used outside of the scope of contact tracing, like never for wiretapping or crime investigation or things like that, is our ongoing challenge. And I'm happy to report we're doing quite well on this regard. Privacy and anonymity would be secured. And at the same time, you want to have waterproof countermeasures. The idea comes one after uh, another. Who thinks about it? Who thinks about it? Tansan, are you thinking of it alone? Or who is thinking of, of these ideas? It is a group of people called GovZero or G0V. You see, in Taiwan, the digital services from the government is something that gov.tw, but if people do not like these services, instead of protesting, they can fork the government, meaning taking the gov website, deploy an alternate vision of it, and call it something that g0v.tw. So by changing a O to a zero, in your browser, you get into the shadow government that's faster, more fair, and more fun. And it's always free of copyright restrictions. So when the Gov Zero people think about a better way to display mask availability in a map, or if they think of a better contact tracing method using SMS, or if they think of a better way to get vaccinated by looking at the available vaccination places, when we then adopt it in the central government, we will face no copyright restrictions and neither party need to pay the other.
So you share in the information and you proceed together, you advance together. I think that's the philosophy. Now we have some questions from the audience, from the viewers. I'd like to introduce to you some of the questions. The first question, you said that information is shared, idea is shared. And in terms of uh, politics, uh, implementation is uh, actually made. That is what we feel from Tansan. The first question, Tansan, you have made an enormous contribution in controlling the pandemic in Taiwan, but you had nothing to do with the politics. Uh, what was the factor for your success uh, in the whole affairs? Uh, what was the reason for your success, although you had nothing to do with politics before? I think to give no trust is to get no trust. That is to say, instead of uh, like a traditional politician saying, trust me, I know the best. I do the reverse. I say, I know almost nothing and the citizens knows best. I trust the citizens with whatever data that I see, the citizens always also see. And then when the citizens think of a better idea, I trust them to develop their idea in a pro-social way, in a way that is beneficial to the entire society, which is why I'm less a politician, but more like a poetician, like I write poems, prayers to inspire people to think out of the box, to be more creative. And at the end of the day, the people themselves understand the why of policy making, the how of science and technology, not just the what, the output of the policies. So there is no fatigue in counter pandemic because the counter pandemic fatigue is usually a result of a top down lockdown measure but because it's the citizens developing their own countermeasures, there's no fatigue. You said that you are like a poet, and then citizens read your poetry, and that there are so many tons, I think, in the society. The, I'd like to go to the second question. To this uh, situation, a Japanese uh, uh, P pandemic measures were a big failure, debacle. The reason is that there was not good communication amongst the politicians, experts, and the bureaucrats. They move on their own interests. There was no coherence and unity. So this person says. So in order to prevent the recurrence of this situation, what can we do? Well, objectively speaking, Japan is doing pretty well on global standards. And I believe that's also because the citizens themselves understand the science behind proper mask use, proper ventilation, things like that, washing your hands with soap. Um, and so always focus on the pedagogy, the educational part. If you feel that your government is not conveying the science in an easy to understand way will do what the Taiwanese YouTubers do, um, hire professional comedians, make beautiful memes, funny memes, um, use cute uh, mascots like cute dogs and cats, making sure that people understand the humor over rumors. Understood. So bureaucrats, uh, I understand that uh, you have a very nice meme as well, which attracted a lot of attention in Japan too. Now, the next question, next topic, that is uh, digital technology, digital democracy. How are you going to use digital technology for democracy? So let's talk about digital democracy in Taiwan. In Japan, maybe this is not uh, widely known, but in Taiwan, V Taiwan and Join, digital participation platforms are used to capture uh, citizens' opinions and to formulate policies. So that attempt has been underway in Taiwan, I understand. So how are you going to uh, bring the online generations onto policy-making arena? 
and、uh, lawmaking arena. That is a big challenge for Japan as well. As you mentioned briefly earlier, up to now, you made a lot of experiments and attempts. So I would like to know the achievements so far. And also, what is your current project? What are you trying to、uh, implement now? Thank you. Thank you. Well,、uh, my first attempt in the V Taiwan project. Was to make sure that people who propose the best ideas in a、uh, crowdsourced idea box is guaranteed to set agenda for face to face meetings with ministers and also other stakeholders. We tackled the Uber X issue, we tackled crowdfunding, teleworking, and so on using these crowdsourced idea boxes. I'm really happy to see that the Japanese digital ministry are also setting up idea boxes, and the people who、um, make the best suggestions also get、uh, the ministerial visits. And I hope this multi stakeholder forum that we've been prototyping、um, can also learn from the Japanese experience now that your digital ministry is also focusing on this. When I b e c o m e the digital minister two years after、uh, the Sunflower Movement and the beginning of V Taiwan, we add to that by empowering the young people, people younger than 18 years old, to make sure not only can they participate in the petitions, but they also have full participation rights within their high schools or within their universities or to propose agendas. That other adults missed. For example, they discovered that sufficient sleep is very important for learning efficacy. So they proposed that we begin the school hours later, and we had a really rich conversation. Or they proposed that during the pandemic years,、um, people would like to develop、um, psychological counseling over the internet. Again, this is a hot topic, and the young people. As digital natives lead the、uh, entire society in discussing it, so much so that、um, every couple of years we choose、uh, about 25, 30 young people as the cabinet's reverse mentors. They mentor our ministers in the way of the digital and sustainability. So, young people become mentors. So, they are digital natives. So, and how are we going to maintain digital sustainability together with young people? I, that was quite impressive. On the other hand, in Japan,、uh, there are、uh, people who do not have access to digital technology, like the elderly, because Japan is the,、uh, quite advanced in terms of aging society. My mother, too, she doesn't know how to use、uh, smartphones perfectly. So, for those uh, people, uh, Extreme opposite of digital natives. For those elderly and other people who have difficulty in accessing digital technology, how are you trying to pick up these、uh, people's voices in Taiwan? We have this idea of the young and senior collaboration. So we pair the senior people with the young people because both age groups. Have more time on their hands uh, and also uh, are more careful of designing long term solutions instead of the working age people who sometimes focus on this quarter or the next quarter. So both sides of the age demographics share the same、uh, long horizon sort of thinking. And so in addition to the companion workshops and so on, sometimes we simply Uh, just bring to the senior people our latest innovations. For example, the contact tracing system is explicitly chosen to be SMS, not email or smartphone, because many elderly people understood how to send a SMS. They look at the QR code even without understanding it. Still, there is a location code like a telephone number, 15 digits printed in the same poster. So they just text to 1922 that string of number, and that still finished the contact tracing. 
And once they learn about it, well, they can teach other people too. And many uh, elderly people in Taiwan, uh, they use a smartphone like a feature phone and use only one app, really, Line, um, which is, of course, as a Japanese origin. So we also work with the company Line to make sure, in addition to use the QR code scanner to add a contact as your friend, you can also use the same QR code scanner to send to scan the SMS and send it. So again, we thank Japanese support in making sure that our SMS-based solution is very friendly to the senior people. And I will also add that at no time did we mandate you have to use SMS. At any given time, you can still use a ink, um, a seal with your name printed and stamp it on the paper or write your contact on a paper that's always accepted. But many senior people, after they learn how a feature phone, not a smartphone, can use the check-in system, they are very eager to use that also and teach other people. Wow, so the government can connect people, can a government can serve as a broker, a go-between among people, I understand, according to your conversation. Now, we talked about uh, digital, digitally disadvantaged people and how you consider those people. In politics, I think, in the economic and the political scenes, how are we going to take care of the vulnerable, the uh, disadvantaged people? That is a big issue for the world as well. And uh, last year, American economist Glenn Weil, who spoke in this World uh, Forum last year, you are uh, involved in a radical exchange movement with him, I understand, the system uh, the can be used for uh, data economy and democracy as well. And you are now trying to teach that to younger generation. Also, you are interested in Japanese philosopher Kojin Karatani's views. And uh, both of these people try to explore an alternative to the current model of capitalism, uh, be it Glenn Weil or Karatani. And how can you use a blended digital technology for such an endeavor, for such a purpose? And I learned a lot from uh, Karatani-san's uh, philosophy of the exchange mode X, which means simply to share without knowing um, who is that you're going to share with. So sharing with strangers and asking for nothing in return. If they reciprocate, that's great. But if they don't, you still share, right? And, and this is really quite radical. And this is only possible because it applies to certain kinds of goods called a public good in the commons, where if you share more, the valuable part of the good grows as you share it. For example, the more people speak a language, well, the richer the culture of that language gets. The more that people contribute to contact tracing, um, the more people the contact tracers can save. So by contributing to a commons, you lose nothing. But if on the other hand, uh, contributing data to the commons um, it makes uh, you receive a lot of uh, advertiser calls, or that your privacy is compromised, uh, and people who do not usually learn about your whereabouts suddenly discover your whereabouts. Well, even though you still contribute to public good, it's at your own expense. It's sacrificing uh, things that you hold dear. And in many designs of the economy, it is the people who are well off, who can pay for service, that doesn't compromise privacy. But people who are not economically well off or they are vulnerable, like as being less digitally competent, are sometimes just scammed or spammed into things that compromise their security and privacy, which is why the idea of exchange mode X is so important because it means that when we design new public services, we make it easy for people to contribute without sacrificing anything. And only then can we truly build something that we share openly.
Understood. Wow. So regarding that point, we have a question from a viewer, actually. I want to ask you the question. So sharing and also how we are going to build a consensus on that matter. And uh, I think uh, we have uh, contentious issues surrounding us, for example, energy, climate change, global warming issue. How are we building a consensus? Uh, declining birth rate in refugees, all these issues are contentious issues in our society. However, the citizens and uh, the public, what would be the effective means to build consensus? Can we use digital technology, digital system to build consensus in such a contentious issues? How could we use them? In that case, how do these digital platforms fit in the existing system like representative democracy? Do you see any possibility of confrontation or conflicts between digital system and existing systems? Um, in our design, starting from Vita 1 to the joint platform today, we <coughs> say that we're not representing anyone. We're representing people themselves, their individual ideas, opinions, feelings. That is to say, when anyone posts on Polis, on Join, on other v taiwan like platforms, they're not asking anyone else to, as a delegate, as a proxy. Rather, what we're doing is making sure that there is a pro-social space where their feelings can resonate with one another without getting <coughs> distracted into flame wars, into hate speech, into vengefulness, into divisiveness. And once this system is built in such a way that many different positions can converge into good enough consensus automatically, then after three weeks or so, we go back and check, hey, here are the good enough consensus on the, say, UberX issue, everybody agree insurance is important, not undercutting existing meters is important, um, taking care of local temple and church is important, and so on. And once these uh, stakeholders see a reflection of the actual picture of democracy that most people agree with most of their neighbors on most of the things, most of the time, then it changes how people think about democracy. Because previously, democracy was conceived as a zero-sum game um, between political parties or candidates. But this is entirely artificial. It's shaped this way because we could only express a few bits of information every four years. It's called voting. But using digital democracy tools, each and every one of us can express a far wider range of preferences and ideas literally every day. And even people who don't have right to vote, like the younger than 18 people I referred to, well, they're now responsible for over a quarter of citizens' initiatives on the joint platform. So you can have compatibility with the existing system. Right now, Japan is in the election mode. Once every four years, we have the general election. Current, uh, the last time, the voter turnout was like 50-some uh, percentage, uh, very low. So we have a, a question from the audience. What is the definition of democracy? In the case of Japan, voter turnout is very low, and uh, we can't say that the policy is uh, decided by people's uh, opinions. Uh, that's not factual feeling. People have uh, jettisoned, uh, people have abandoned the right to vote. Is it a part of democracy? That's a question. So reading from your uh, opinion, Tansan, democracy does not happen once every four years. It happens every day. Is it right? That is correct. Demos, or the crowd. Uh, kratos, the power. So the power of the crowd, the power of the people, is a direct function of how much of the policies that affects each and every one of us can be shaped by those 
digital or face-to-face -face democratic places. And I emphasize places because around the world, there's many place-based experiments like participatory budgeting that are very successful and local scale town halls, conversations on both the internet and face-to-face -face on the common issues affecting the community. So this small community-oriented democracy is not some future science fiction. It's something that the community builders already know very much. And in Japan, it powers many successful regional revitalization efforts by allowing democratic participation across generations on the economic prospect of a rural place, a town, for example. And so by making sure that people understand this is also democracy, that democracy is seen not just as voting, but as anything that can express the public preferences as social objects for people to discuss, then it becomes very natural then to imagine democracy as a set of technologies that each and every one of us can use and the local budget, the local regional revitalization plan, and so on become like today's weather. It becomes something that people can talk about all the time. With the digital technology, you create places, and the digital technology helps the creation of places. On the other hand, we'd like to go to the next theme, digital technology and AI. So AI is something, what, what is going to be the relationship with mankind? That is a question that we'd like to ask you. Digital technology will create a place. And on the other hand, it can monitor, it can issue instructions and orders. Some people have worries about that surveillance society with the AI. Now, AI is not artificial intelligence, you say. Assistive intelligence, you are saying. It's an intelligence assisting humans. That's what you are saying. So what is the difference? Where, from where this difference comes? Well, assistive intelligences empower people and connects people. As we are having this conversation, we both have human assistants, the interpreters, professional interpreters, helping us co to communicate across very different languages. But the assistants themselves, the interpreter themselves, are benefiting from assistive intelligence that empowered this video conference. We are benefiting from the noise cancellation. I'm not wearing a earphone, so the sound that you make in the speaker is automatically canceled uh, when I send my sound over. So uh, we understand what each other is saying despite a loud speaker between us. That's not possible without machine learning and assistive intelligence. But this is not replacing any human. There was no human being's job as a noise canceller. It's simply unimaginable. So by adding to the assistive chain of people and machines that help us to connect, we ensure that the interpreters are empowered, not replaced. Now I see, but in China, I heard that because of the face recognition and behavioral record and scoring system is being employed, and the high level of surveillance society is in the making in China. This uses digital technology. Now, Tan San, the AI used in this way, is it going to authoritarian intelligence? I think you are saying that the AI is standing for authoritarian intelligence if technology is used in this way. This is the quite opposite of assistive intelligence, I suppose. But the Chinese people are not necessarily opposed to this authoritarian intelligence. 
It's not that the Chinese people are detesting uh, such uh, the happy surveillance uh, society. Maybe Chinese people are accepting uh, this uh, society. In this uh, context, uh, authoritarian intelligence, uh, is it possible to prevent the expansion of AI in this way? If it is possible, what will be the means of preventing in order to bring well, the AI to assistive intelligence? What can we do? Well, certainly what you're saying is that there are existing authoritarian regimes, and within those regimes, authoritarianism is the norm. So building technologies to um, further this authoritarian norm feels almost natural, especially for people who enjoy the authority in the authoritarianism setting. This is, of course, true. But this is not a new topic. This has always been the same thing ever since democracy was practiced anywhere on Earth. People who develop on democracy develop this because we understand that only when there's a free range of various different ideas, expressions, fashions, even cultures, can we respond quickly to new and emergent phenomena in a way that is agile. And in a society where the authoritarian uh, regime knows best, when they encounter something uh, that is beyond their comprehension, well, there is no free journalism sector, there is no whistleblowers, there is no um, a independently um, critical people who can help figure out hey, there's something new that's going on. So I believe instead of positioning democracy as anti-authoritarianism, we must just keep advancing democracy. And then as new emergent phenomenon comes, um, people who are kind of wondering whether their polity should go more authoritarian or more democratic will come to feel if they embrace the democracy, especially digital democracy, well, then they don't have to make the compromise between privacy and freedom on one side and, I don't know, public health on the other. In that context, Tansan, now about AI, should be connected to digital democracy. What should be the ways of using AI? Uh, the uh, good uh, democratic, uh, what kind of image of a democratic society do you have uh, where the appropriate application is made by AI? As I mentioned, AI, assistive intelligence, connects and empowers people. It's as simple as that. Whereas authoritarian intelligence concentrates power from people and it doesn't empower anyone, rather it disempower everyone and aggregates the power into a engineering elite, I guess, in a authoritarian chambers uh, of command. And so I would say that even with the current digital democracy development, it's not a solution to everything, obviously, but we are already seeing that with the open source, open innovation communities, even the places that were previously more authoritarian, well, I should know because when I was a child, Taiwan was under the martial law. Even in the places like uh, Taiwan when I was a child, can see that obviously developing some digital democratic capabilities is not just a good governance system, it's also good for cultural expression and economic reasons. Now I see. With a digital technology, there is a question from a mother who has a son uh, began beginning to interest uh, in uh, digital technology. 
uh, junior high school kid. Digital is uh, very convenient, but what do you think of pitfalls and uh, uh, damages? Uh, well, she says that uh, because of the pandemic, uh, the, her son is uh, really at home, and uh, sometimes uh, uh, he is taken to computers, and even his uh, physical body is a nuisance to him. Physical things are uh, so nuisance, uh, and it's very difficult for him to feel the joy of reality. That's what uh, this mother is worried about. Of course, she's not uh, negating the di digital technology, but she's worried about it. So pitfalls and uh, demerits of uh, digital technology, how would you respond to this question? Yeah, if someone is addicted to um, a computer function, a feature of a computer, then the computer is no longer a assistant, right? The computer becomes the boss, uh, and that person become a addicting slave to the boss. It's no longer a assistive relationship, uh, and so I would say, just as with any addictive, potentially addictive substance, treat it as a symptom, not as a sickness itself. The sickness may be that the person, um, young or old, addicted to technology, actually crave for more meaningful relationships, in which case spending more time with them probably help. Or if they are craving for acknowledgement, for a sense of belonging, and in which case um, connecting to a local purpose-based community will probably help. But at no time, uh, say, computers are bad, or computer games are bad, or things like that, for they're just vehicles. Personally, I'm very easily addicted to a touch screen. So I almost never touch a screen. I always use a keyboard, a stylus, or things like that. Because with this intermediary, I must have a intention before I interact with a screen. But if I use um, a touch screen for a prolonged time, then I confuse, my brain confuse the touchscreen with my finger, with my body. It become kind of part of my body. And I develop the same kind of addiction that people develop to their body parts. And that's not a healthy uh, relationship, which is why some sort of understanding and some sort of mitigation is always very important. Understood. I have the next question, maybe it is related question, that digitalization has to be promoted in a society with diversity. Otherwise, digitalization can become a tool to manage and control people. As you said, so digital technology will become both your both. Then, if that's the case, we have to avoid that. Then, how could we respect diversity? So maybe we can use digital technology to make people respect diversity. So what kind of activities are required of people to move in that direction? I think diversity is just a beginning, and inclusion uh, is really what uh, the pro-social digital spaces are for. That is to say, if a space is diverse in its members, but the member rarely learn from each other, then it may be diverse in a representational sense, but it's not diverse in a representational sense, in the sense that the group doesn't present themselves um, as a transcultural um, polity. So uh, my suggestion is to invite people to step outside of their comfort zone a little bit and then facilitate and participate in the discussions and see their original culture from the angle of a culture that I feel strange to. And this is transculturalism, seeing our own upbringing, but describing it with a different culture, a different language, a different lens. I talk about the citizens' initiatives. And when we hold cross-ministerial conversations uh, from the people's ideas, we make sure that the facilitators are public servants in an unrelated ministry. So when we talk about tax filing reform, 
the facilitator may be someone from the Ocean Affairs Council. But when we're talking about the ocean affairs reform, maybe the finance ministry will facilitate the breakout discussions. And the reason why is when the ocean affairs council personnel hold the tax filing system conversation, they take the position of the tax filer. And when the finance participation officer hold a ocean affairs conversation, what、well, they take. The position of an amateur fisher or surfer, so they are no longer identifying with any particular positions. They are instead sharing their experiences serving in the public service. So by building cross-functional teams, both in the digital realm and in face-to-face -face settings, we can move from an identity-based position. To a experience-based common values and conversations. So, listening to your remarks, so we have to design and create places or space that is extremely important. So, from this point onward, I would like to shift the gear to focus on Japanese children and、uh, young people. The Japanese、uh, com children, compared to children of other countries, are often said to have lower self-esteem, self-affirmation. According to you, I hope that、uh, we can find the clues that Japanese kids become more positively confident about the, themselves. So, if you See children in Japan who are being bullied or who are bullying others, or those who are remain as silent bystanders. What would you like to say to each of these types of children? When you are a child, I understand you are bullied as well. You openly talk about your experience. So, could you give some message to those children? Yes. First, to like yourself. And then to unmute yourself. To like yourself means that whatever reason that you were bullied、um, from, those are not the excuses for you to internalize those bullies'、uh, negative feelings toward you. Rather, you can see your unique experience as something that you can contribute. Because once you make this experience public, that's when the community, the society, can learn how to adapt so that this kind of negative behavior do not happen again, or is at least lessened, reduced, because people become aware of it. So, making yourself heard, unmuting yourself, saves the next person. That's. Probably going to be bullied exactly the way you were. By making it a public issue, a social issue, you are making unique contribution to the society that people without your experience cannot make, and that's unique about your experience. So,、uh, by making it public, they can. Make contribution to the society, and they can be aware of the fact that they actually contribute to the to the society. I have the next question. At the age of 24 years, you、uh, made public the fact that you are transgender.、Uh, uh, in Japan too, there are many people who are struggling with gender identity. What kind of advice would you like to give to those Japanese people who are struggling with gender identity now? Well, I'm post identities, right? I'm post gender, meaning that instead of saying I used to identify as this and now I identify as that, I now say I had a puberty experience when I was 13, and I had another puberty experience when I was 24, 25. Notice the difference. If I say I identify with this and then that, it's like I move from one city to another. And in my mind, it will be a binary difference. Like people used to be close to me are now away from me.
But when I say, oh, I had this experience and then I had another experience, it means that regardless of your puberty experience, probably we have something to in common that we can talk about, right? So it brings everyone closer instead of pushing half of the population away. So the experience will build up. You can build up your experience one after another. So in such a sense, uh, education, I think, is very important. So what is the ideal education? So let's talk about that. Under the COVID-19, on the scene of Japanese schools, digital equipment and digital technologies have been introduced more and more rapidly. But on the other hand, there was a case in which a device provided by school was used for bullying, which resulted in a suicide of a kid that is very saddening. And also, some kids have become addicted to computers, as was mentioned earlier. Also, uh, if, uh, so if we introduce digital textbooks, digital learning materials, uh, there are education businesses who will be able to exclusively get information regarding the study history of children. So there is a possibility or risk that uh, such education business would get uh, exclusive access to data. So digital technology and equipments to be introduced in education scenes, what do we have to be careful about? What do we have to be aware of in introducing digital technologies in education? In my job description, I said, when we see the virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. And the difference is, of course, that a virtual reality narrows our possibilities until such a day that only uh, oneself and no one else met us in a virtual reality. But a shared reality is a persistent part of the world. It combines part of the physical, part of the cyber, but always expanding in the horizon so you can spontaneously meet people who share your values, your interests, and so on. It's an expanding reality rather than a narrowing one. So when we're designing education-oriented spaces, we must always make sure that they are open in its possibilities, limited only by the creativity of the children, allowing free remixes of the work that they do, instead of being um, made into just one single mode at the request of one single large company or large state, as you just alluded to, which is why we always prefer open source, open hardware in our educational facilities. It should be open and shared. That is why that everybody will be able to use them and share them. So then, in such a process, teenagers, young people are becoming more and more participating in digital spaces. May There could be fake news. How? children can gain skills to distinguish fake news from genuine news, what kind of teaching is necessary at home and in school, what kind of guidance is uh, needed. This is, again, another question coming from a viewer. Many people have such a concern. Um, in Taiwan, we don't use the F word. Um, we use um, this information, which are intentional untruths that creates harm. It's like spam, but spreading at a viral speed of scam. So like scamming spam. Uh, and the best way to guard against that is to develop competence as journalists. Journalism is the, the art and science and practice uh, to collaboratively discover what's really going on and contribute to a balanced understanding of the world as it changes instead of fixating 
on one stereotype, on one bias, and so on. Journalism is about the rigor of balancing different voices, finding a interpretive frame that allows further investigation and reporting to happen. So in Taiwan, instead of media literacy, we teach media competence. Literacy is to read and view the media. Competence is to be the media, to create media, and so fact checking, like during our presidential debate, the three presidential candidates in their forums and speeches were being fact checked in real time by many people, including middle school students,、um, and students also participate in the counting process after the election and helping to upload. Uh, the films that they filmed to make sure that the reported issues around the election tallying process can、uh, very quickly let the clarification spread faster than the rumors. And there's many cases where, when people worry about air pollution, for example, the middle schoolers just measure the air quality themselves as part of their、um, even primary school science curriculum. And in all these examples, people understand what's actually going on. They have listened to the various different positions and formed their own ideas, just like a journalist's. And once they do that, they become vaccinated in their mind against the virus of the mind that is the disinformation crisis. Well, you stand on the side of information givers, and then you are vaccinated regarding、uh, against the disinformation. During the school classes,、uh, do they do that, or is it an extracurricular activities? How do they teach it? It is part of our. It is part of our curriculum. If you are interested, yeah, there is the M Learn portal、uh, for media learning. That has the curriculum material for basic education and also for lifelong education. Well, that is something that we would like to see the penetration in Japan. That kind of learning in classes. Now, the last theme. Well, actually, this was not included in the last theme, but there were questions like this. This is a question from a high school student. This、uh, student is active,、uh, active on environmental issues. But no matter how much、uh, the student works so hard,、uh, but、uh, he does not feel that、uh, he he is a part of the、uh, power to move the country, he or she. So how can、uh, what what can I do to make my country better? So that was the question from a high school student. Can you respond to this、uh, question? In order to have the actual feeling that you are really making the country,、uh, what should he do or she do? The most important thing is to see yourself as just a vehicle of the ideas worth spreading. If I learn of a new way of doing things today, and I share it to one or two people, on average, if I share it to more than one people, then that idea goes viral. It has a basic reproduction rate of above one. And if you can help improving its R value even more, making it even more viral, by making it more funny, by I don't know, writing a poem about it. Uh, making internet memes with cute animals or, or whatever, right? And then those ideas were spreading, were spread further because of you. So you don't have to do everything yourself. All you need to ensure is that after practicing an idea, whatever you have learned, make it even more viral than the idea you originally re received. So you become a trigger yourself, right? That's entirely correct. And then the trigger will have a cascading effect. And then you don't need to、um, teach more than two or three people because each of these people will teach three or four or five more people.
Well, today, thank you very much for your contribution. You are minister in charge of digital affairs. There are so many Japanese wanting you to become the Japanese minister in charge of digital affairs. So to the Japanese uh, viewers, can you leave any message for the Japanese audience and viewers? Well, you already have a digital minister, and I look forward to work closely with your newfound digital agency and also with the entire Japanese population. Uh, and I look forward really to visit in person again, thanks to your generous vaccine donation. And until we meet face to face, I wish you all live long and prosper. Well, thank you very much, Audrey Tansan. <laughs> Thank you. And dear viewers, thank you very much for your participation. So this was uh, the uh, Asahi World Forum 2021, Taiwan Digital and Democracy. Uh, Tansan and the viewers, thank you very much.